Amen. I want you to grab your Bibles. If you haven't already figured that out from our bumper there, I want you to grab and open up to Psalm 103. We're on a week two of a little kind of mini sermon series through a couple of what I think are some of my favorite psalms. Last week we were in Psalm 139. This week we're in Psalm 103. And let me just remind you, maybe just as a, as a good reminder, maybe even things that we already know. Let me remind you about what a psalm is. It's a song, but more importantly, it's a song of worship is what we find in the psalms. I always say, like I said last week, when you look at it, it is not only just a psalm of worship. It's an opportunity to look at the heart of David. It's an opportunity to look at the the heart of the worshiper, but it is an opportunity. These psalms are an opportunity for God to become the object of our worship. God is the object of these psalms and the object of these songs, and his purpose is to reveal. His purpose is to reveal who he is, and his purpose is to reveal who he is to us and what he is like. This is the purpose of all of creation, and we even see represented in psalms. The purpose of all of creation and everything that's ever been created is to reveal God's glory. And what we learn all through Scripture, here's the wonderful thing about Scripture, is that God is a master in revealing himself. He does it in every kind of fathomable way. He does it through singing. He does it through worship. He did it through a burning bush, God revealed himself. He did it through a talking donkey one time. He does it through preachers and his word and his spirit, through visions, through dreams. We learned last week Through his creation, through the visible things, through rain patterns we learned last week, through the eyeball. Had somebody email me after last week's sermon and they're like, hey, thank you for all that nerdy stuff about creation last week. And I'm like, man, I could go all day. I read a story years ago about a a spider, this European water spider. Anybody ever heard of the European water spider? European water spider is not an aquatic insect, and yet it lives and functions in the bottom of lakes and waters and streams. And you would wonder, how does it do that? It goes to the top of the water, does somersaults on the top of the water, creates bubbles, takes those bubbles, puts it over its breathing kind of holes in its midsection, scuba dives down to the bottom of the water, makes webs in the seaweed, comes back to the top of the water, grabs all those bubbles, and makes like a protective barrier on the bottom of the water so it can eat, live, mate, and live. And let me tell you what I think of, just like Psalm 139, when I think of all that nerdy kind of a stuff, I look at God's creation and I think, wow, just like last week. I think he is glorious. He is unbelievable in a million different ways through what we can see. God shows off who he is and from an infinite amount of ways in in his invisible characteristics, he shows us who he is. He is amazing. And that is the point of our lives. And that is the point of our worship. And that is the point of these psalms. I don't think we can ever Understand how massive, even when we look at all of these ways that God has revealed himself in his glory, there's no way for us to understand the chasm that still exists between what we can possibly comprehend of our God and his goodness and what in reality his glory really is. We come to Psalm 103, and let me tell you why we have Psalm 103 and the reason why we have Psalm 139. The reason why we have Psalm 139 is because David knew what I know and what you know is that while God is glorious, and while God is indescribably good and awesome, oftentimes we, his people, his followers, are unimpressed. It sounds hard to say that. He gave us Psalm 139. Let me tell you why he gave us Psalm 139. He wanted to remind us of who God is. Why? Because we forget. How is that even possible? You see t-shirts these days talking about Jesus. Jesus is my homeboy. Wrong. No, he's my king. We talk about God like he's the big man upstairs. No, we need Psalm 139 to remind us we don't even have the foggiest clue, really of how glorious he is. And we have Psalm 103. Let me tell you why. Because we forget not only who he is, we have Psalm 103 because we forget even who he is to us. 
We need Psalm 103. David knew we needed Psalm 103 because we, we live like we're bored with God. We live like we're disinterested in God. We live like my children most days. I look at my children and think they have every video game under the sun. They have every game. They have everything in the world. And yet, what did they tell me in the middle of July and summer? I'm bored. I have nothing to do. And I'm like, that's not true. And yet here we have a picture, a revelation of who God is and the infinite benefits and the blessings of his goodness in my life. And yet we will walk around and forget him and be disinterested and be bored. This is why we have Psalm 103. The glory of God ought to be an insatiable desire in our life that flames our Christian life. We ought to pray like Psalm, when, Psalm 27 every day, that God would turn our gaze on the beauty of the Lord, and yet most days we're sleeping. So we come to Psalm 103, and here's what David is doing. He knows this about himself. He knows that he can be unimpressed. He knows that he can be lazy. He knows that he can forget even this man after God's own heart and let me tell you why he knows this because David was a shepherd David being a shepherd would have remembered Psalm 23 he would have remembered John 10 he wouldn't have remembered it he would have known it that we need a good shepherd why do we need a good shepherd because we are sheep let me tell you something the first time I ever heard that when I was coming to know the Lord Jesus I didn't like that and you're a kid and you're growing up and they say, what's your favorite animal? What, what, if you could be any animal, what would you want to be? It, sheep ain't at the top of my list. When I was growing up, it's shark week. This past, Hey, shark, man, that would be an awesome one. A tiger, that would be amazing. An eagle so I could fly. Nobody's picking a sheep. And let me tell you why nobody's picking a sheep. Because of the four Ds. Because historically, sheep are dirty, defenseless, directionless. And I know this may sound harsh for anybody who loves sheep. Dumb, dumb. They're defenseless. When any other animal and all of creation is attacked, the two fright and fight things come into play, but not for sheep. They have no fight. They have no talons. They have no venom. They have no teeth. How are they going to fight? How are they even going to flight? They can't run. They, they, they have no wings. They're not fast. They don't even have a scary posture. No arching your back like a cat. No hissing, no growling. There's no part of them that can defend themselves. What do they need? A shepherd. That's their defense. They're dirty. They've been around sheep dirty. Their bodies produce lanolin, this secrete this oil, and it's to protect their wool from the weather. But at the same time it protects their wool, what does it do? It keeps every other kind of nasty, dirty piece of grass and dirt and bug into their wool and their body. And the longer that hair gets, it gets matted and nasty. And sheep don't like water. They can't lick themselves like a cat. They're just nasty and dirt. They're directionless. Inherently bred to what? Follow. Even if they have to follow to their own slaughter. It's where we get that term. Like a lamb to the slaughter. I read a story years ago in eastern Turkey. About 1,500 different sheep who walked off the side of a cliff. The shepherds had taken a break. And like, surely we'll be good here. Surely these animals will just kind of stay here. And they walked off the side of the cliff. And here's the interesting part of that story. Only 400 of them died. Anybody want to take a guess why the other ones didn't? The other 1,100 because the first 400 formed this awesome pillow for the rest of them to fall and not die. True story. Go look that up. And here's what I would say. You put all those things together. What kind of animals would do that? And maybe dumb's not the right word, but stupid is. They're dumb. God knows this about us. He didn't even call us sheep. In John 10, he added another word. Hey, little sheep, you need a shepherd. David knows this. David knows this as he's writing. David knows this about himself. He knows it about me and you. He knew that he could and he would easily forget what? How awesome we learned last week God is. How awesome we're going to learn this week he is to us. He knew what it was like to feel tired and feel alone and feel apathetic and feel ungrateful and feel just like we do sometimes in the middle of summer, even with God. He knew what it was like to feel blah. So what does he do? Look at these first verses. He gives himself a pep talk. He's talking to himself. Matter of fact, he's not talking to himself. He's giving a pep talk to his soul here is what he says. Look at these first verses. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, 
And all that's within me, bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Here you have David, and what is he saying? Things that we ought to say to ourselves every day. Come on, soul, where are you? Why are you sleeping right now? Wake up. Come on, soul, why are you dull? Come on, soul, why are you sluggish? Look at what God has done. Look at who God is. Look at what he's like. He begins to preach to his soul. Soul, I don't like that you're lukewarm. Soul, I don't like that you're half-hearted. Soul, I don't like that we're running on half energy. Soul, I don't like that I'm walking around half-brained. I don't like it. Come on, soul. Don't forget the Lord. And here's what he does from, from that verse. What he begins to do in verse 3, all the way through the end of this song, this psalm of worship, is he begins to worship by reminding himself of just what he said, of the benefits of God. I mean, he does what we used to sing years ago, decades ago in church. Count your many blessings, name them one by one. Count your many blessings, see what God has done. That's what David does here. You might have got your sermon notes today, and you're like, my goodness, what is there, nine points? I'd have packed a lunch, brought a snack today. I just want to walk through these very quickly. That's the sermon. Let me tell you what. Anybody in here need a pep talk every now and then? Anybody? Anybody in here be honest and say, you know what, I need a pep talk about God every now and then. Look around at our world. Look around at my life. Look around at my, I get too focused on me, too focused on my feelings, too focused on my emotions, and I forget. I become ungrateful. I become disillusioned. I start to let the world, when I take my focus off of who he is and what he does for me, it starts to rob me of what? My joy, rob me of hope. Sometimes you just need to go through the bag of blessings and the benefits. David says, I just need to remind myself of the things that I forget because I'm a sheep sometimes. And this is what he begins to do. And he starts it in verse 3. And he starts at the best place possible. Look at verse 3. He says this. Let me start listing the benefits. He says, God is one who what? Forgives all. Oh, underline that word. It's a good one. Shows up a lot in this psalm. Who forgives all your iniquity and heals all your diseases. Talks about it more in verse 11. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is the steadfast love toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west... So far does he remove our sin, our transgressions from us. God is the one. Let's remind ourselves this morning. We will forget this. We will forget to preach the gospel to ourselves. There is never a bad day on this planet. There is never a day without hope. There is never a day without joy for a follower of Christ. Why? Because today, because of Jesus, your sin, your iniquity, your transgressions are all of it, every single bit of it has been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. Amen? We have a reason to sing this morning. God is the one who forgives all our sins. That word is a big word for David. I mean, he says it in verse 1. He wants us to praise God with what? All our inmost being. He goes to verse 2. We will remember not just some of his benefits, all of his benefits. You go to verse 21, 22. He wants all the heavenly hosts, God's heavenly hosts, and all his works to praise him. How could we possibly let a day go by without remembering to praise and thank God for first forgiving us of all our sins and releasing us from guilt? How is that possible? I do it. How is there a day where I have breath in my lungs where I don't get on my knees and say, God, thank you for saving me from sin. Thank you for taking my place. Thank you for turning back your wrath. I'm going to tell you something. If somebody dove in front of me and knocked me out of the way of oncoming, oncoming traffic, I promise you there wouldn't be a day in my life where I didn't wake up and think about that and tell somebody. This is our life. If you ever get bored, you ever get apathetic, you ever get unimpressed with God, let me tell you where you can start. Preach the gospel to yourself. I love this. Paul Tripp says, In our sin, we constantly find our responses to life in our fallen world to be disconnected from the theology that we confess. Anger, fear, panic, discouragement, they stalk our hearts and whisper a false gospel that will lure our lives away from what we say we 
believe. We preach the gospel to ourselves every day. The gospel is that he has removed us from our sin. This is the glory of God in Christ Jesus. And it's a wonderfully reactive thing. We preach the gospel to ourselves because you know what? Every single day I'm reminded because of my sin. After I sin, in the middle of my sin, I remind myself that I need the gospel today. It wasn't a one and done. Today the gospel, the work of Jesus on the cross is removing sin from my life that that is in my life today. It's wonderfully proactive. I preach the gospel to myself to avoid sin. I think about Jesus on the cross and what put him there, and it would make me take my sin infinitely seriously. We preach the gospel to ourselves, and it will create joy. It will drive us to worship. We ought to look at ourselves, look at ourselves in the mirror and say like David, listen up, self. Listen up, Brad. God has forgiven us all of your sins and released you from guilt. Even if I had only sinned one time, knowing that that sin, that one sin would eternally separate me from God forever in hell, and yet I have sinned hundreds of thousands of times, and yet he has what? Removed me from that sin. (sighs) You gotta be doing cartwheels. How far has he removed it from us? What a wonderful image David gives us. Does he leave it in the next room close enough for me to smell it? Does he he leave it close enough so that he can dig it up when he needs to wound me? Can he pick it up like we sometimes do in our fights with our spouses and say, you know what, I, I remember you did this, though. Let me grab it and use it as a weapon against you. No, he says as far as the east is from the west. You know, if you go north on our planet, there is a point where you will go so far north that you will now start to go south again, but not with east and west. Go on this planet, you start walking east, you keep walking and walking and walking and you'll never get west. You start walking as far as you want west and you just keep walking and walking and walking for infinity, you will never get east. As far as the east is from the west, David knew what he was saying when he wrote that. You can't get east and west to me. It is infinitely separated from you. Ah, that's good news. It's good news because of Jesus. It makes me look with awe upon our God. Maybe not as nerdy as the eyeball or planets or the European water spider, but I look at that and I stand in awe of God's glory. Starts and he gives us our first reminder here and he says, let me remind you, you've been set free. You've been set free from your sin. Look at verse three, he gives us the second benefit He says this, who forgives our iniquity and heals all, all your diseases. He releases us from grief. I mean, we live in a world, the truth is, we live in a fallen world. And here's what happens in a fallen world, that it leaves us open to the possibility over and over and over again of cruel diseases and illnesses, mental, physical, emotional. The world's broken. What an unbelievable blessing. We're going to talk about this minute because I think this has been the source of confusion for so many people that he gives us a wonderful benefit that he has healed all of our diseases. And let me tell you, just to address the elephant in the room, I think there's so many people who would read this and they would say, this is a mistake in the Bible. This is a, a promise that maybe is too idealistic. This is a promise that, that God was making that was too big that he has not kept David should have thought before he, he started just writing these things down. I have cancer. How come he hadn't healed it? Hey, I'm struggling with diabetes. Where's God at on that one? He broke his promises here. Really? All of our diseases? I think so many people, this scripture has lost them. Here, maybe people would read, and it's one of these dozen places that we read in the Psalms where he seems to promise things that are too good. They're too far beyond anybody's ordinary real life experiences. And I just want to take a moment here because you know what? This is one of those tensions we live theologically in Psalm 103, this tension between having a faith in Jesus Christ This tension between these spiritual blessings that are ours already, but yet the enjoyment of them is not yet ours. Let me explain this for a second. We get these promises all through Scripture that the two two phrases you need to remember are already and not yet. They're ours. I possess them, but maybe just yet I haven't experienced the full enjoyment of them. It doesn't mean they're not real. 
doesn't mean that God's a hypocrite or a liar. I think about it like being engaged. Yesterday, celebrated 17 years of marriage to my uh, wonderful wife. It's amazing. It went by fast. And I can remember the engagement period. I remember going and spending a ton of money, more money than I had ever spent in my whole life, thinking, is this the way we want to start this marriage? I'm going to spend all of my money and buy this ring. And I remember I would put it on my, my future wife, come, soon to be wife's finger, and here's what I would say. I know this is secure. This is going to happen. And there's going to be all kinds of enjoyment and wonders that come through the years. And I know that I'm going to enjoy, but this is secure now. This is what we see in the Scripture. We see it with all kinds of things in Scripture. I mean, I can look at it with our adoption. Romans 8.15 says we're, not a, we're already adopted in Christ. And yet, by verse 23, it says we're not yet adopted. Ephesians 1.7 says that we're already redeemed in Christ. But Ephesians 4.30 says, but not yet redeemed. 1 Corinthians 1 says we're already sanctified in Christ. 1 Thessalonians says, but not yet sanctified. Ephesians 2.8 says, we've already been saved in Christ. And yet, Romans 5.9 says, not yet saved. Ephesians 2.6 says, we've been raised with Christ. But 1 Corinthians 15 says, not yet raised. Begin to see here, I can be adopted in Christ, that that's my relationship. But there will be a moment where I experience the full joy of that adoption when I'm with him face to face. That I've been redeemed in Christ. And yet still... Day by day, dealing with my sin, purchasing me back from my old self and my flesh, we see it. Sanctified in that I've been made holy and pure and good, and yet day by day, what do I see? This process of becoming what I've already been made to be. Saved in Christ Jesus, secure in my place with him, and yet there will be a day where that has been completed when I'm with him in glory. Let me tell you the same thing about healing. Healing, yes, obviously it can occur here. God is the creator of everything in all of the universe, and he stands outside of creation. And so it means even today, yes, he can heal today, and we ought to ask for that. We had to pray that he would heal our cancer. We had to pray that he would heal our, uh, our maladies. That we had to pray that he would heal our mental illnesses. We had to pray for those things. And God does do it. But even if he doesn't hear, let me tell you something. We rejoice in Christ Jesus. There will be a day where we all are perfectly healed from every single disease. More importantly, every spiritual disease that we have as well. You know, at the age of 28, I was diagnosed with stage 3 cancer. Still have it today, not in remission. I had somebody ask me one time, don't you wish God would heal it? Of course. And they would think I'm a crazy person when I would look at them and say, but you know what, even if he doesn't do it right now on this little blip, this mist that appears for a little while, let me tell you something, I'm as healed as I can possibly be. I can't be any more healed than I am right now. I will never die. You in Christ Jesus, let me tell you something. It's why Jesus referred to it as sleep. You will never die. How can I be more healed than that? When I leave here, if it's cancer or whatever it is, I'm not dying, it's sending me home. What a blessing. What a peace. What a grace. He gives us the third blessing as we, we count our benefits. Not only has he forgiven us of our iniquity, not only has he relieved us of grief look at verse four he redeems our life it says who he what redeems your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy to redeem something is to take back ownership in the old testament redemption involved deliverance from slavery deliverance from bondage on the payment of the price by the redeemer and let me remind you what he says here with this pit this pit that he's referring here is not a a physical earthly pit he's not talking about a prison he's not talking about a dried up cistern the pit that god redeemed us from is sheol it's hell it's a spiritual grave You have been bought back from a spiritual, eternal pit and prison of sin. The destiny for all of us before Jesus and without Jesus is death and it is hell. And on the cross, T. Telestai, what did he do? He paid my price in full. He stamped it on the bill of sale. Bought. He's mine now. Praise God. He's a different destination, a different home. He's no longer a prisoner. 
And then here's what the glorious, glorious, scandalous part. The redemption is free, but don't make a mistake. It is not cheap. God is the only one who can redeem us. He is the only one capable of paying the price because it is too high for us. We can try and work our whole life. We can work to try to gain success, gain knowledge, ignore sin, rationalize it, change the standards, but nothing will save us. Nothing will pay the payment we owe except for Jesus' perfect sacrifice on the cross. You today in Christ Jesus have been bought back from slavery. You have been purchased by the blood of Jesus from death and destruction and an eternity separated from God. That's glorious news. Glorious news. He tells us in verse 5, let's count these blessings. He says he what? He also, verse 5, satisfies us with good. Who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. What does it mean? It means that God rewards us. He gives us. He satisfies us with, this is an understatement, good things. You know, one of the things I love about God that we remind ourselves when we forget is this. God does not always give us what we want. That's not what this verse is talking about, but God does always give his children what we need. Let me tell you what I think most of us forget in our busyness, in our sheepishness. We forget in just the Mondays of life, we forget the goodness of God. Most of us, we we get way more focused on the negatives. We get focused on the diseases. We get focused on the hardship. We get focused on the struggles. And we miss the infinite amounts of goodness and blessings that we see every single day in our everyday lives. We forget the blessings that we have just to sit on the back porch and hear birds sing. And hear the oceans roar. And hear our children's voices knowing that there are people on the planet who cannot hear. What a small grace and a blessing. I can go to the store and I can buy water and milk anytime I need it and yet I know that there are people on the planet who cannot do those things. We overlook the simple and the ordinary and in that miss true evidence of God from whom every good and perfect gift comes. I mean, I love it. James Merritt, pastor, said this, you've been given a lifetime, and in that lifetime, you have about 29,200 days or 700,800 hours. You experience joy and loss, calm and challenge, welcome and rejection and shifts and stagnation. God's goodness is present with you in all of it, in the everyday workday minutes, in the electrifyingly wonderful moments. He is always good, and we have each living moment in which to experience it. We get to the end of our days. Let me tell you a good practice for us, a good discipline for us to preach the gospel to ourselves, to sing God's goodness over our lives, to remind ourselves to preach to our soul and say, was this a good day today? Let me tell you something you ought to do. You ought to just look at the daily bread that we've been given, that we would look around and most of us in this room, look, we meet in this room right now without fear of persecution. What a wonderful blessing. We have the word of God, not everybody on the planet. Not every follower of Christ has the word of God available to them. They can just pull it up on their phone. Can they pull it up and, and pull out their Bible? We've got it in every imaginable translation. We've got kids' Bibles, cops' Bibles, ESV, NASB, NIV, New King James. King James, it's amazing. We have, all of us in this room, food to eat, roofs over our head, people that love us. And even if we didn't have all those things, Even if we had all of those things taken from us, we still, at the end of our days, could look at the end of the day and say, God is good and that he has what? Satisfied us. Maybe even if we were poor and homeless, he didn't satisfy us with food that day. He didn't satisfy us with with a roof over our heads. But yet, even the poorest among us earthly in Christ Jesus would say, he has satisfied me. I am content with his love. We ought to pray even like at the end of all of our days, like Psalm 90, 14. Satisfy us in the morning with your steadfast love that we may rejoice and be glad in all of our days. He's a God who in verse 6, what? Says the Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. He helps the needy here. 
He helps the needy. The needy that we have mentioned in this passage of Scripture, in this verse, is the oppressed. Oppressed are people who cannot help themselves. We think of in Scripture widows, orphans, foreigners, the poor. God loves. What good news to remind ourselves about the glory of our sovereign God. The God who has created our bodies and, and knew you before you were formed, your unknown substance who created the planets and the universe and the spiders and everything else and all of the world. Here's what I want you to know about him. He loves to help the weak. He loves to help the helpless. He loves to help the hurt and the despised and the shameful. And he reminds us of that. Let me just describe for you who the oppressed is. Let me describe for you who is the needy. You. You. Without Christ Jesus, according to Ephesians 2, you are dead. He reminds us. It has to be my favorite passage of Scripture in all the Bible. When people ask Pastor Brad, what is your favorite passage of Scripture? Here it is, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 through 31. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose. What did he choose? What is foolish? That's me. In the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak. That's me. In the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world. That's me. Even the things that are not. To bring to nothing the things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. And because of him you are in Christ Jesus. Who became to us wisdom from God. Righteousness, sanctification and redemption. So that as it is written. Let the one who boasts boast in the Lord. He helps the needy. And maybe you just cross out needy and write your name in there. He loves to help. Continue to count our blessings. Look at verse 8. He shows mercy. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. You know what it means that the Lord is merciful? It means he does not give us what we deserve. What I deserve? Death. What I deserve? Punishment. What I deserve is eternal separation from him. Thank God. What a wonderful thing ought to bless our days. That he doesn't give me what I deserve. Not only does he give us mercy, he, he offers us grace, which is I'm getting what I don't deserve. That's what grace is. I'm getting freedom. I'm getting redemption. I'm getting adoption. I'm getting a new identity. I'm getting hope and confidence and joy. Do I deserve any of those things? No, but he offers it. Give me your sin and I'll give you grace and mercy. He's slow to anger, means he's patient with us when we fall. He's abounding in love, means he loves us more than you can possibly even fathom. What kind of mercy does he offer us that we would remind ourselves every day? Every day you wake up with a brand new set of mercy clothes every day. Where you and I would run out of mercy with one another and with our children and with our bosses, God's pit of mercy never runs dry. It is plentiful. I love it. Charles Spurgeon worded it like this. He says, all the world tastes his sparing mercy. Those who hear the gospel partake in his inviting mercy. The saints live by his saving mercy. We are all preserved by his upholding mercy. And cheered by his consoling mercy. And we'll enter heaven through his infinite and everlasting mercy. That's a lot of mercy. It's plentiful. And let me tell you what, we all need it. What a wonderful blessing and who God is and what he does for us. Look at verses 9 and 10 as we continue on. Just reminding ourselves, counting these blessings. He mitigates his anger in verses 9 and 10. David reminds us about God that he will not always chide, nor will he keep his anger forever. That is good news for me and you. He does not deal with us according to our sins. Uh, He's different than human beings because that's what we do. Nor repay us according to our iniquities. You ever met somebody who just liked to fight? Got husbands and wives just elbowing each other right now in here. They just like to argue. You've been really angry. You know how hard it was not to go pick a fight and to keep it going? You ever met people in the church who just like to stir up issues and create dissension? And especially when it's deserved Can I tell you something that I would remind myself about God that I believe is infinitely glorious like the stars in the universe? God, who had every right reason to be angry, totally justified in his anger, says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to temper it. I have every reason to squash us all like bugs. And yet because he is love, he says, I'm going to withhold. 
and I'm going to mitigate my anger. That is different than anything I've ever seen on this planet, praise God. He is uniquely different than any person and anything that I've ever witnessed on this planet. He is willing to end the fight, end the quarrel, end the argument, and welcome us back into the home and the house of God. When we forget to pray, he remembers to feed us still. When we forget to give thanks, he still sends us restful peace and sleep. When we are idle in our sin, he sends his Holy Spirit to convict us. When we refuse to give, he keeps on giving still. When we fall, he lifts us up. When we disappoint ourselves and others, he still calls us children. We could go on and on and on. When what we deserve is his anger, he covers that multitude of sin with love. Covers it like a roof. Ah. Oh. Feel like an infomercial right now, but there's more. There's more. How can there be more here? Look at verse 13. What does it say here in verse 13? As a father who what shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear. And let me tell you something. It was hard for me to understand that. I'm thinking we already covered this compassion. We already covered this mercy, David. We already covered this grace. And yet he gets really specific here. As a father shows compassion to his children. It probably wasn't until I had children that I could understand what David was talking about here. Let me tell you a wonderful, glorious blessing in in Christ Jesus that we have with the Father in heaven is that he understands our weakness. Not only does he withhold his wrath because of our disobedience, he understands that I'm not perfect and I'm weak. I think of a story, this is what I'd share as we kind of come to a close. I think about Luke. My little boy Luke, I forget how old he was, we took him to Legoland in Florida. I don't know if you've ever been to a, a park like this, but one of the attractions that you could go to was one of these big climbing nets. It was massive. Some big ropes that you can climb up on, big cargo nets, but I mean, they're like five, six, seven stories high. It was amazing. Even for me, I'd kind of get up there and think, I don't know if I'd like this. They tied these nets on real tight. And, and here's the interesting thing about Luke. He was so fired up. He'd never done anything like this before. He's like, I can't wait to get on this, this net. It's going to be awesome. Him and Reagan start climbing up on the net, and they go first floor, and second floor, third, fourth, and fifth. And you know what? The whole way up, he never looked down. It wasn't until he gets to the very tip top, halfway across the cargo net, That's when he decides, yeah, let me just take a look down through the net. And man, he froze. (laughs) Scared to death. And they make rules. Adults aren't even allowed out there. It might be, you know, you're way too much for that kind of a thing. He's frozen. From about me to the back of the sanctuary, he's stuck in the middle and he is crying. And here's his cry. I can still hear it today. It makes me sad. He's like, Daddy, help me. Help me. And I kept telling him, boy, just go. Reagan was out there, come on. He wasn't going. He was death grip. I'm like, I'm going to have to break these rules. I'm going to have to break these rules. And you know what? There was a part of me as a father who heard that. I'll never forget it. It breaks my heart. Daddy, help me. Man, I don't care what the rules were. I don't care who would have told me no. I'm going to get my son. I'm going to go get my boy. He can't do it. He's afraid. He's weak. He's just a little boy. Man, I hustled out there and I grabbed him and he latched on me as tight as he could. He said, I love you, Daddy. Oh, I wish he would still do that. What happens when they get older? They forget to tell you stuff like that. I, I love you, Daddy. Thank you, Daddy. Let me tell you what. Compassion for your children, that's the kind of compassion that we see in this scripture. He knows. He knows, even after he set me free and went to the cross, that today... There will be moments where I disobey him. And he looks at me and he says, I know who you are. I chose you. I chose the weak things of the world, the shame things, the despised things. What a glorious thing to know that he still will let me climb up in his arms. Even after he disciplines me. And I'll say, I love you. Ah, that's good. Let me give you a couple more that we see here. Actually, let me just give you one more. And this one I think sometimes people leave off. Just verse 14 and 16. He says, for he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for men, his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field. For the wind passes over it and it's gone. And its place knows it no more. But the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting and everlasting to those who fear him. And his righteousness to the children of children. To keep to those who keep his covenant. And remember to do his commands. This may not seem like a blessing, but just hang with me. He remembers that you and I are dust. We're like leaves on the tree in fall. They lose their chlorophyll. The reason why they start losing their greenness is that they're dying. As beauty as fall is, we're witnessing death. 
He says, this is what I know that you're like. Your life is like these leaves and like the grass. It's kind of like when now at 43, I let my beard grow out a little bit and I start noticing a lot more gray in there. And just hang with me, because this is going to be real encouraging. And that's the point of reminding us. But you look at that, and you know what gray hair reminds me of? I ain't going to be here forever. That's what it reminds me of. That I'm losing my, my chlorophyll here, so to speak. <laughs> that I'm losing the leaves on the tree. I feel like I'm gaining more to the trunk, but I'm losing the, the tree leaves. And here's the thought that I had. Just hang with me a minute. The point that's glorious in this is one word that I think we miss. But the steadfast, listen to this in verse 14. For he knows our frame and he, and he remembers. He remembers. You know what I know about trees? There, there ain't a single tree on the planet that knows all the leaves that fall off of it. It ain't keeping records of it. Just a leaf. Let it go back to being dust. My body ain't keeping record of the hair that's turning gray and and fall into the side, and yet we have a God who, even though we are infinite and tiny and weak and our lives are a little missed, guess what he does? He still remembers. He still knows. Even though he's from everlasting to everlasting and we're not, he remembers. I know for so many in the world, they would look at God and think, how could a God this big, Psalm 139 God, really care? He's so big, like David said, he's so high, I can't even attain it, I can't comprehend it. And yet at the same time, let me tell you what's is just as much glorious is that he knows every hair on your head. And he made you. And he loves you. And his desire is that none would perish. And you would be his child. This is what we see in Scripture. God remembers and sees you and has made you a way for you to not be empty, to not be unfulfilled, to not be disinterested or bored, but to be with him forever. What is our response this morning? What is our response to Psalm 103? When we go home and we read Psalm 103, maybe we put it to music, maybe we rewrite it, maybe it's one of the psalms you take here and you want to rewrite it and post it for next week out on our board. What is the appropriate reply to this? We start this psalm by saying, come on, so." Come on, soul, wake up. What's the appropriate reply? Verse 20, bless the Lord. Oh, you his angels, you mighty ones who do his word, obeying the voice of the word. Bless the Lord, all his hosts, his ministers who do his will. Bless the Lord, all his works in all places. Bless the Lord, all my soul. If you want to have a day, you want to wake up every single day, and you want it to be not, come on, soul, wake up. How do you end the day with bless the Lord in worship? Don't forget. Run to his word. Preach the gospel to yourself. And let me tell you what it will do. It will satisfy you with his goodness and his glory. Maybe this morning your response is to simply come to this altar. Come to one of our pastors. Our, our, our band's going to come back up. They're going to be playing. This is a time for you to respond. This is an opportunity for you, maybe for the bored in the room, for the disinterested in the room, for those who have said, you know what, I would rather read a magazine, Southern Living, than read this. Maybe God is not as exciting as Netflix or, or the latest football game or the recruiting news or my job or whatever it is that we put on the list ahead of him. Maybe for the first time in a long time, you come to this altar and say, God, nothing compares to you. And I repent. And you stand up from the altar and say, God, don't ever let me, little tiny sheep, forget who you are. And we run to his word and catch a glimpse of his glory. And we say, just like Psalm 139, wow, and whoa. I'd ask that you respond this morning. Maybe you don't know Jesus. All of these promises, all of these benefits can be yours. All of them. Today. He's alive. He wants you. He wants to know you. It's ready to set you free from all of your iniquities. I pray whatever it is this morning you would come. Would you stand? So we have an opportunity to respond. I pray that whatever you do, you would respond how the Lord leads you in this time. Let me pray for us and we'll have a chance to respond. God, we thank you. We thank you for this worship. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Jesus, for not just these nine things, but all of your countless benefits. Don't ever let us forget like sheep, our good shepherd. I pray in these moments, God, we would come to you and we would put our attention, our affection, our gaze upon you and that we would let that only grow in the time 
ahead. We praise you, Jesus, and thank you. We pray this, Jesus, in your name. Amen.